once we, you find joy, why is it so hard sometimes to, to kind of hold on to and, and to keep? And we're going to see that this focus we talked about last week, about having living missionally minded, with our eyes focused on Jesus, is the first step in finding joy. And then there's other aspects that God's going to lead us to that help us sustain and maintain the joy of our salvation and help us maintain our focus and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And one of the biggest ways is the collective body of Jesus Christ in church, Amen. the gathering. You know, Paul's in prison, and we see he's speaking about joy. <laughs> and that's just so counterintuitive. It just doesn't make sense. But he's speaking joy from prison. And he, in this passage we're going to see, is alluding to the fact that part of his joy is taking part in the church, in the brethren. We're going to see that Paul is writing to this church in Philippi that we talked about last week. And he's saying, I long to be with you guys. I long to be back with you in person. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the joy that's found in the gathering. Let's continue our joy ride today. Let me pray for us before we dive into God's Word. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, we lift you up. Lord, we exalt you because, Lord, we're here for you. We're here to praise you. We're here to worship you. We're here to bow down to you. Lord, we're here to hear from you and to obey your word. Lord, would you speak to us today, every single one of us that are gathered in this place, in worship, in drive-in, online, however, Lord, you've led us here. Father, would you speak to our hearts today through your word because I know you have a message of joy for all of us. Because, Lord, you didn't mean for us to do life alone. And there's strength in numbers. Father, help us hear from you and commit our lives to you in such a way that no matter what the circumstances are around us, no matter what we face in our world in front of us, that we have, we sustain, and we long for the joy that's only found in you. I praise you, God, for what you're about to do in this place through the presentation of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, our passage today, we're in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 11. And I know we captured verses 3 and 4 last week in our, in our passage last week. And if you missed that, you really need to go back and listen to that because we went through an overview of how this church in Philippi started and, and who Paul was and, and who he was writing to and, and what, this, what was happening, what were the circumstances around the writing of this book of Philippians. So you need to go back and hear that message if you missed it last week. But today we're going to grab verses 3 and 4 as well as from last week, and we're going to read through verse 11. So read with me, and I'm going to start reading out of the New King James Version, guys, as you follow along. We had been reading out of the NIV. The NIV for me was just missing a little bit of translation too much, but I wanted something smooth reading as opposed to the these and the thous of the King James. So we're going to start reading out of the New King James Version for most time. So the Word of God says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, making requ request for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Just as it is right for me to thank this of you all, Paul must have been a country boy, you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all to, with the affection of Jesus Christ. In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. That's huge. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Huge speaking there to these brothers back at Philippi, 
longing to be back in their fellowship, longing to be back in the church. Hey, something's taking me away for a moment, but I can't wait to get back with you guys. So let me ask you, do you love church? I mean, yeah, a lot of amen. Give me the Sunday school answer. Yes, pastor, of course we love church. That's why we're sitting here. No, I mean, do you love church? I mean, to the point where you hate to miss it, where it's not okay. Man, I can't wait to get back. I, I, I hate that I missed the message. What did he say? And I want to get back in here, and I got to get online. I mean, that, that's what I long to happen. I, I, I pray every day, Lord, let me preach it and, and, and deliver messages in such a way where people just are hungry for the word and want to come back. And it's not about me and not about my words. It's about your words. And, and, I, and I hope I've done that. And I think I, I have preached for four years, and, and I think I've only put John Scalise to sleep one time. And, and, and I, I think he was really tired. Maybe we worked, overworked him. I don't know. But, but guys, I hope that, that you feel and you feel the hunger for God and you feel the hunger for the gathering to be in church so much that you don't want to miss. And that you want to tell everybody you know to get in this fellowship and be a part of what God's doing. That's what we long for here at Impact. I mean, it's, it's even in our name, the logo. And this logo, so speaking of our four-year anniversary, was drawn three years before we launched. This logo was drawn at 2 a.m. in the morning in the middle of the night in the year 2014. God woke me up in the middle of the night. My wife and I have been praying about, you know, where we're going to plant a church. We know the Lord was leading us to plant. And I'd finally surrendered to that after pushing back for a couple years. And, and now we were praying over where? We, we were praying over Raleigh, Durham area, Charlotte. We were praying over here. It's like, Lord, where, where do you want this church? And what do you want it to be called? And we were praying that. In the middle of the night one night, the Lord woke me up, 2 a.m. in the morning. I hop up out of bed, and my wife's like, what's wrong? I was like, the Lord just told me what the name of the church is. I got to go write it up. She's like, great, tell me in the morning. So, <laughs> so I go in the kitchen, and, and I draw the logo that you see right there. <laughs> and... You know, and we could go into it in, in a lot of depth. I don't really have time, but this logo has the gospel inside of it. And it has the very personality of this church inside of it. The large I kind of represents the great I am, God the Father. You have all the letters in between, and I don't know if you've ever noticed that they're connected. All the letters are touching. That represents the Holy Spirit unifying the body of Christ, the gathering, that we're all in unity together like in Acts. Of course, the T at the end, obviously, is a cross representing Jesus. There's a point at the top of the cross that looks kind of piercing. That's for the Word of God that pierces even into the marrow. We have a fish hook on the sea at the top. That's for being fishers of men. There's so much in that logo I could continue to tell you. It gives a upward and forward motion, which is what the church and us individually as followers of Christ should be about. It's about moving forward, upward and forward for Jesus. It's all in there. So as we see what Paul is alluding to here about this togetherness, it's even in the logo of this church. That we long to be together. We long to be of one accord. We long to be doing life together. We long to be moving forward for Jesus. And I hope you long to be here every Sunday and be a part of what God's doing. You know, the, the Bible describes church as being the bride of Christ. We see that in, in Ephesians 5 and Revelations 19 where he alludes to this description of the, of the body of Christ, the church being like the bride. Those of you who are married, when you stood, men, at that altar with that pastor that day, and you saw your wife for the first time that day in that dress. Did it get you choked up? Maybe a tear to your eye? Of how special this day was, how special this moment was, where the bride was being presented to you. And you were to spend forever. Hey, man, I'm getting John Scalise excited up here. He going back, all right? Going back, we're going to renew some vows here this week, right? <laughs> So guys, there's this moment when the bride is presented. And I want you to think about that. So at this, this church, the collective church of Jesus Christ, is the bride to be presented to Jesus. And how we are to make ourselves ready in this special moment that God thinks of us this way. So how important is it then for us to walk in his ways, 
to make ourselves presentable to him, useful to him, because God's work is done on this earth through the Spirit, moving through the body of Christ, which is the church. God gives us a heart when we truly are saved, when we've committed our lives to him and surrendered our lives to him. God gives us a heart to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. He does. So we, as we grow in our walk and our faith, we start to love the very things that God loves. And one of those, the biggest thing is the church. Do you love the church? And even love the people in the church and be like, hold up now, pastor, you're crossing the line there now. Hey, hey I know God's got some really quirky children sometimes, right? And, and we may not necessarily like or want to hang out with all of them. But we're commanded to love them and to see the value of, of us as a collective body of Christ. Yes, we, we hate what's evil. We hate sin. We even hate, get this, we don't just hate sin in the culture. We don't just always be quick to point it out in everybody else's life and in the world. We hate sin in our own life. Amen? And we, want, we don't want it. And, and yes, we know that, that even as Christ followers, even as people who are, claimed followers of Jesus Christ, that we're going to fail, we're going to mess up. But we don't make excuses for that, or we don't get condemned by that, but we make sure that we don't make those same mistakes in the future through the Spirit and through the power of God. And we're going to talk about that a little bit here at the end. And that's what God collectively wants His church to be going the direction of. You see, church is not a place, it's not a building. It's about people, that we are the church each of us individually, then formed collectively, are the church. And I think that's got misconceived so many times today, especially in the Church of America, where church is about big fancy buildings and entertainment. And what options and ministries do you have, and this and the other. And it's about the body of Christ getting together, surrendering to Christ, and doing His work. Some people may say, you know, Brad, you asked that question, man, do you like church? And, you, you know, some of you listening today and maybe in here or maybe online, you say, man, I, I really don't. Because maybe you've had some bad experiences at church. Maybe you've had some people that have personally hurt you. Maybe you've seen some people in spiritual leadership make some really bad decisions. Maybe you've seen them where their heart was truly exposed for who they are and it broke your heart because you thought they were something way different. And it's turned you away from church, turned you away from being a part of the body, the collective body of Christ. Maybe you look at others and maybe you, you say, man, there's a bunch of hypocrites. I don't want to be around a bunch of hypocrites. Guys, I want to tell you and I'll give you a news flash, and I hope you know this. Not everybody that goes to church is saved. Not everybody that preaches in the pulpit is God-honoring. Not everybody that goes to church is committed to Jesus, unfortunately, but it's very biblical. You see, and here's the beauty of that. We're not to keep our eyes on man anyway. You see, church, going to church, does not make you a Christian. You can stand in your garage all day long. You'll never be a car. <laughs> you can stand in a weight room all day long and you'll never be Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? There's a difference between just being somewhere and being something. You see, being somewhere doesn't make you something. Being something is an internal attitude of the heart which is outwardly displayed in your actions because of where your heart is. So, yes, we'll see man fall. As long as there's people coming to church in the flesh, there's going to be failure. So the enemy wants to use that and to make you not like church, not make you like to be a part of the bride of Christ, to give you an excuse and a way out. But that's always of the enemy. Let me repeat myself. That is always of the enemy. Any desire in you to not be a, one of, be a part of the body of believers is from the evil one who wants to isolate you and separate you from God's people. He wants to keep you away from the joy and the strength that's provided in numbers. That's why we keep our eyes on Christ, not on man, and not on an establishment. Church is about having an encounter with God, a continual encounter, not a one-time encounter, a continual encounter that engages us 
with a holy God who continually changes us through his spirit as we surrender to his will. That's church. And that's what we come for. And we need to hear the word in its purity so we can hear from God and not from the opinion of a man, but from the word of God so that the Holy Spirit can do his work. That's why I'm so big at Impact Church. I'm preaching the Bible and not standing up here and telling a bunch of stories and telling a bunch of jokes and all that kind of stuff. You get the occasional one. But that, I, I'm not a comedian. I'm not a storyteller. I'm not an entertainer. I'm here to fulfill a mission that God's given me that I tried to run from for a couple years. And he said, get back here, boy. <laughs> and I have to walk in it. And God has, has shown himself faithful through some of the hardest and most challenging of times of being a church planner. But it's about having an encounter with God. I had one, have you? I continually have an encounter with God. Do you? Each week. Man, he's changing me. He's shaping me, molding me continually more into the image of his son. I hope he is you as well. And I hope we're growing in fellowship together. So we see in this passage that Paul loved the church. And so should we. Because we know that Paul loved the church because he loved Jesus. And was willing to even endure persecution for the name of Jesus. Do you love Jesus that much? Hey, man, it's good stuff. So let's look at this passage today. We're going to pull out four specific ways that we can find joy in the gathering of being a part of God's church. So number one we see is we are in fellowship in the gospel. We have fellowship in the gospel. If you look at verse 5 right there, it says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. There's joy in fellowship, guys. Do you believe that? Have you experienced that in church? You see, in fellowship, so many times we kind of, we've kind of dumbed that down in the church to be like, you know, that's just a quick time where we kind of get together and talk about things over food or coffee. And that's partly fellowship, that is. But the fellowship that Paul's talking about here is deeper. It's doing life together. It's, it's, it's more than just the, the superficial kind of talk of the weather and the circumstances of the world around some food, although I love to do that. But this is a deep fellowship of connection because what we're after in fellowship is unity. And when you think of unity, you start to think of the word team. Anybody ever been a part of a team? You know, I'm big on team. I love team. Played football much of my life and in high school and college. And in football, you learn to really understand the value of team. Because there's a, 11 guys on the field at a time, all doing a different job, all with different sizes, different strengths, different speeds, different talents, different abilities, but they're all working toward a common goal collectively. Guys, that's what Christ wants us to do as the body. You know, is that we're all a part of this body of Christ. We're all a part of a team, but we're all given different talents, different abilities, different things to, to function and work within the body. And that's why it's so big that we sign up and serve, that you have an opportunity to serve the body of Christ and what God's doing in this community. That you don't just wait for, for, for me to do it or Tim to do it or the elders to do it or, or, or whoever. That it's your church, that it's, it's God's work through you as well. I'm just another player on the team. That's all. God just got me in a different position. But you're just as important, just as equal. From the parking lot to the pulpit, it does not matter. God has called us to serve him and be a part of the body of Christ. Have you answered that call? Do you understand that value of team? You see, this church in Philippi started with fellowship, talking around the river. The gospel was presented. The Lord broke the heart of Lydia. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. Her whole household got baptized, and this movement started in her house. She said, hey, guys, why don't we come and meet at my house? So this church got started and grew. It grew as a body. And you think about that slave girl that, you know, that we talked about Paul last week got annoyed and said, you know, in the name of Jesus, get out of her and call the demon spirit out of her. You know, it's not said, but maybe she joined a part of that fellowship. How about the jailer? that was saved as Paul and Silas were in there and, and the earth shook and the chains fell and, and they were still there and the jailer was about to kill himself. He said, no, stop. And the jailer was like, 
because of that, because I've just heard y'all sing praises in the midst of all this. Y'all are in prison, and I've heard the glory of the Lord, and I've seen it on your face, and I've seen it in your actions. Now I want to know what I must do, do to be saved. Oh, man, it's beautiful. And so maybe he joined the fellowship as well as part of this church at Philippi. Beautiful instance of God growing and bringing team together to do what he needs to do. There's strength in numbers. And this is the part where I want to cue up that video if we can, guys, and a little video to kind of show just how individually maybe we're not as, as strong, but as a group that we can do what we can't do on our own. Let's check this out. <laughs> Guys, we could do more together than we can apart. So I want to tell you right now, Satan knows that too. Because Satan has seen the times where he has overtaken and been able to overtake people individually. But when they get around a group of believers and followers of Christ who strengthen them, who provide that inner joy and continuously point them back to Jesus in the darkest and most challenging of times, then he sees them slip away and back into the hands of God. So I want you to see this push that Satan wants to make, I believe, across our society today through this pandemic to isolate people, to keep them isolated. Yeah, you're better at home, safer at home. I get all that. But ultimately behind that is isolation. And it's destroying people mentally. And then you couple that with all the uncertainty and things being stripped away and, and things like sports and everything take away from our kids. And you see the devastation that it causes from being isolated and not being around people. And then you couple that even farther about churches, you know, closing down or some of them haven't even opened since the pandemic. And you see the isolation that's taken place where people can't collectively be a part of the body of Christ. And you see the devastation that's taken place. You see a lot of people that once were active in church and, and involved and then when, when COVID hit, that they've been separated out a lot of them to never to return to the fellowship. And it breaks my heart as a pastor to see that. And I, and, I, and I know the enemy is at work behind all this. And I told you a few weeks ago, you know, as, you know, the question was, you know, are, are, are we going to close down and, and this and the other? And the answer was no. And, and the answer was, was not no in a cavalier kind of we're tougher than that attitude, but out of an obedience to Jesus that's called us to the fellowship together. Because, and I told you, and I'll tell you again, and I just went out yesterday and, and went out toward Ward's Road to pick up some of these chairs from Sam's, and there was literally thousands of people buzzing around that place. The road was packed, double-laned as far as you can see, stores, restaurants, packed, people everywhere. And I just thought again, why would we close down the church of Jesus Christ when all this is going on? The hospital doesn't close down. Why? Because people are sick and need help. So why should the hospital for the hopeless close down when people are sick and need help? 
We're going to be smart. We're going to be wise. God's made multiple ways for us to worship in the safety and where we feel comfortable. But we're coming to gather and be a part of the body of Jesus. That's why spending money on them eight windows right there was so important to me and the elders. Was so the people in drive-in could be a part of the fellowship still. And at least see my bald head as the light glides off of it, right? You know? <laughs> it is just and somebody honking. You can see that. So there's, there's just, so there's value in this gathering, guys. And I want you to see that and feel that from Scripture today. Strength in numbers. We know anybody's ever been to a gym and, and you have a spotter that you can lift more when there's a spotter behind you because you have confidence. You know somebody's there supporting you. And when, even just going to the gym, you're more likely to go to the gym if somebody's meeting you there, right? So there's, there's, a, there's an advantage in doing life together and in numbers. Ants themselves, stronger collectively than they are individually, even as strong as they are carrying 50 times their body weight individually. In numbers, they can do magnified things exponentially more than they could do by themselves. We look at Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 and, and Romans 12 teaches us that there, we are each a part of a body and that no one part is more important than the other. And then Romans 12 tells us that we each have different gifts, and we're to use that for the glory of God. So that's when we come together as a team and do great things. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 says this. It says, two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And I love this part at the end. A, thre a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Did you catch that? It's talking about two in this passage the whole time. Two, two, two. The strength and the powers of numbers of us being together. But then there's an extra strength that's added at the end. Three. Who do you think the third one is? It's Jesus. Guys, when we get together, yes, there's strength in numbers. And when we get together, together with Christ at the center, and we add him to the strength and the unity, it's unbreakable. And I want you to feel that strength and that bond and that unity within the body of Christ. And Paul very clearly says that this fellowship that we're in together, this gathering, is all about the gospel. That we are in fellowship in the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the truth of Jesus Christ. It's God's word of who he is, of the salvation message, of the just dying for the unjust for those who surrender their hearts to him and receive him. The Bible says that all who would receive him shall become a child of God and enter the family. That's a beautiful aspect. So we're called to reach people, guys, as a part of this collective body of fellowship, that we're called to the gospel. We're in fellowship for a purpose, not just to hang out, but to be on mission, to be missionally minded. Did you know that your command is to be a minister of the gospel just as much as the command is for me. Every bit of it. And maybe not from a stage and a mic, but in your life and in every aspect of where you go and who you touch and who, who you speak to and who you're around. Your command is to be a minister of the gospel. Because here's the truth. You know people that I don't know. And if you depend on me to reach them, I'll never reach them because I don't know them. I don't work with them. I don't play ball with them. I don't run into them in the stores, whatever. God has placed you out there to be salt and light. And you and I need to understand that, and we need to be the church every day. The church, again, isn't just the time we gather. The church is who we are as we shine the light of Christ to others. We know Matthew 5, and we quoted that a couple weeks ago, quoted it again. It says, you are the light of the world. A city, a town on a, built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither does somebody light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that people may see your good deeds and glorify who? Yourself? No, your Father in heaven. Hey, that's a beautiful picture of why we are to Walk out 
this faith. Why we are, like Paul said in Ephesians, why we're to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Because of what Christ did for us, now our return, our desire should be to live for him in such a way that the light of Christ shines out of us to reach others. That's the beauty of the church. And speaking of this aspect of family leads us to our second point of the four. Why? Is there joy from the gathering? Because we get to be a part of a family. Look at what Paul says here. It's beautiful as he uh, finishes up verse 5 and talks about in 6, being confident this very thing, he who began a good work in you will complete it. And then it says in 7, just as, as it is right for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. We have this idea that we're together in the grace of Christ and that we have a heart for each other. That describes family, guys. That's family. Just like you have your family that you're a close part of, and when division sets in, man, there's no pain like family pain, is there? I mean, that's some of the deepest hurt and pain there is. Why? Because family is close. Family's a unit. Family is a bond that shouldn't be broken. But so many times, because of, again, sin, our shortcomings, division comes in even in family. So a great time to, to even see within the church that we're to have a heart for each other and to walk with each other in grace. Do, have you shown grace to maybe your own family? Maybe somebody's hurt you and, or, and you've held bitterness in your heart toward, do you know that you're commanded to forgive and that we are to walk in grace? It doesn't mean you forget. When for, you forgive, doesn't mean you forget. It just means that you release that person. And then regardless of whether they've apologized to you or not and what their heart is toward you, that we're to offer grace. Do you know what grace is? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is providing a way for you and I to have eternal life in heaven and not get what we deserve, which is hell. Did you know that? Just the fact that you and I get to go anywhere other than hell is God's amazing grace to us. That was given to us through the death of his son on a cross because he loved you so much. That he wanted to restore the fellowship. That he wanted to restore eternity for those that would receive him. That's grace. And that's the only reason that you are saved. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by these righteous acts that we want to live out to shine the light of Christ. We're saved by faith in Christ. And then through that faith, through that saving grace, the same grace that's used to save you is also used to sanctify you and to give you spirit so that you're moved toward God's word and obedience. It's beautiful. You see, grace is loving the unlovable. Too often, yes, we've, we've understood that we're to have fellowship here. We see this in this passage, that we're to be a family. But so many times, people inside the church get so upset with each other that they can't stand to even look at each other. I've seen those scenarios and been in those situations, and it's so harmful. Is there somebody that you need to make right with today? Maybe even in this church. Maybe it's part of your family and you need to get it right with them today, that you need to offer them grace, forgiveness, the same grace and forgiveness that Christ has given you. What could God do with that? What could God do with that if that you set your heart toward that today and restored fellowship and a bond of family within your own family and especially within the body of Christ? It's a result of God's unmerited favor, His grace. Look at John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. If you don't believe me, maybe Jesus can say it better. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Here's the kicker. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Is it any more clear than that? If we're a follower of Christ, what are we to do? Love one another. Display grace. Yeah, there's times where somebody harms us, comes against us, makes us mad, 
We get in the flesh for a moment, then we got to get out of that, put it under the blood, and offer grace and forgiveness back to that person. And not let it be a hindrance in our walk, or in their walk, or in the fellowship of believers. It's so important, and it's so hard. And it takes the grace of God for us to walk in that way. So there's fellowship in the gospel. There's a a, a, a heart of family within the church. And then the third way that we find joy in the gathering is through growth. And this is a big one. Did you know you should find joy in growing in Christ together and individually? That that is why we come to church, to be a part of the mission and to grow spiritually together, individually, to hear from God's word. And and Paul's, Paul's very clear in that. He says, as you grow here and as you're partakers of this grace, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you. Then look at verse nine. I pray that your love may abound still more and more. Talking about that love. And then he moves into this. And more in knowledge and all discernment. Knowledge and discernment of what? This. Growing in knowledge of God's word and what he's commanded you to do and I to do. And then the discernment. Do you know what discernment is? To know when you run into something in this culture, in this world, that's contrary to this word, that a red flag should go off in your brain. The check engine light, if you will. Right? Hold up. That didn't sound right. That's discernment. Hold up. This doesn't look right. You know, on the surface, this kind of initially seemed okay, but as I hear the heart of this person or this organization or what's going on, This doesn't line up with this. That's discernment. And you move away from that. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in teaching us, giving us knowledge and discernment. That's spiritual growth. Because I'm going to be honest with you, this world's gone crazy. And there's a whole lot of stuff out there that will trip you up if you let it. There's a whole idea of relativism, of relative truth in our culture that, that what's true for some person doesn't mean, you know, it's true for another and, and that sounds really good because it sounds like, oh, we're all just going to love and give a group hug. Oh, blah, blah, blah. But, hey, there's absolute truth here, guys. This Bible is not relative truth. This is not up for discussion. <laughs> it's not. This is absolute truth. It's God's Word. It's infallible. It's inerrant. And it is just as applicable to today as it was the day it was written. And what this book still calls sin is still sin in the culture today. I don't care what anybody else says. Do you have that knowledge and have that discernment to know when somebody's trying to tell you otherwise? The church is to bring us together for growth so that we're not tripped up by false teachings. Because I'm going to be honest with you, what this generation tolerates the next generation will embrace. It will. We've seen that time and time again. What you and I tolerate today is what our kids will embrace. So what are we being tolerant of that we need to put our foot in the ground and say, no, absolutely not, because I stand on God's word and I don't care the persecution, the unfriending, whatever that comes afterwards, because I stand for Christ and Christ alone. And that's where growth occurs as you begin to stand in the knowledge and discernment that God's giving you through the fellowship and through the presentation of his truth. And if we're going to grow, guys, what do you have to do? What are things that grow, like a a plant, it's got to be connected to the dirt, right? To grow, you got to get connected. Connected in the body of, of Christ, connected through the Holy Spirit of salvation to have the Spirit of God in your heart so you could understand His Word. The Holy Spirit is your teacher and gives you the discernment that you need through His Word. You have to be connected. And, and to be connected amongst the body of believers and to grow in this fellowship and walk, you got to be here, right? There's the gathering to be a part of something bigger than just yourself. If we're going to be the church, We need to be about the gospel. We need to be about the gathering because God wants to work. And that's where the attendance thing gets brought up so many times. And it breaks my heart. Did you know that the regular attender, the the churchgoer that's considered a regular attender in the world today, do you know me? how many times they go to church each month? 
twice. That's a regular church attender. Twice. That's 50%. Did Jesus go 50% of the way to the cross for you? Why don't we want to be in church? Why? Why would we want to spend eternity in heaven with a God that we don't even want to spend time with on Sundays? Why is so much else in our world so much more appealing than church? Has it, and could it be that maybe our heart's been deceived? And I don't mean to get legalistic here. Please, please get the message right. You know, you have to come to church. You have to come to church. You have to come to church. No, 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 no. Your desire should be to come to church. And that's what we're getting at. It's after the heart. Because when we have that heart of Christ, we love what he loves, remember? And he loves the church. He loves the fellowship. We should long to be in this fellowship. So we've already talked about it briefly, but I want to just bring up something. So don't let this pandemic make you a COVID casualty. And you say, you got that right. And I don't mean physically, because all we all know, nobody here wants to die of a virus or any disease, right? So we're not talking about when we say don't be a COVID casualty, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. Don't let this pandemic, don't let COVID-19 separate you out completely from what God had you a part of before March 13th. Please hear that. Please. And again, with all grace and understanding, I know some people have to uh, avoid the groups because of health conditions. I'm a physical therapist. I know and understand that well. I completely understand. I understand that. And so there's grace given. And like I said, Lord, bless these cameras and the message that goes out on Facebook each week for those people to be a part of a service that cannot be a part of the fellowship. But for those of you that can, and you know who I'm speaking to, but you're choosing to not come to church because it's easier to stay in your yoga pants and pajamas and sip your coffee, I want to, with all grace and respect and as politely as I can, offer you the invitation to get back in the fellowship. Because I want to ask you, why would you avoid this if you can go to every store, every job, everything you do all week long? Why do you avoid this? And that's just for the people who know who I'm talking to, who God's talking to. It's not my word. It's God's word. And it's a graceful call back to fellowship. It's not a condemning message, guys. Please don't, please don't get the condemnation message. It's an offer of grace and mercy to come back and to be part of the body so that as we saw in that humorous video, we can have the strength and joy that's found in numbers. It's beautiful, and that's what God wants you to be a part of. And as far as my call as a pastor... And to yours as well, Hebrews chapter 10 is very clear. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Here we go again, talking about some of what we just talked about. Here's the key. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I don't know about you, but I can see the day approaching. I can see revelation being played out. It may be two more lifetimes before the Lord comes back. I don't know. But I believe we're marching right now in the fourth quarter. And if you've ever played a sport, the fourth quarter is not the time to unlace your shoes and go sit down on the bench. It's where the players want to be in the game. Give me the ball, coach. I want to make a difference in the fourth quarter. How about you? Hey, that's the call for the body of Christ to make a difference, to be salt and light, and to not forsake the gathering. And this wasn't obviously Hebrews 10 when this was written. It was not, this isn't a, a new concept that some people get in a habit of missing out on the gathering. Because I believe there's an enemy behind that that wants to deceive. They make them think they don't need to be here. Because he wants to isolate, just like we've talked about. You know, the, the scariest thing about missing church is pretty soon you don't miss church. <laughs> and you get out of the habit. And you don't miss it no more like we talked about, that desire, that yearning to want to be here. Don't let Satan have that foothold. Don't let Satan have that victory. 
make a stand to be a part of the fellowship. I love 1 Timothy chapter 4, kind of follows this calling, and we're going to read it out of the NIV this time. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 says this. It says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Let me say that again. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Sounds like a pretty clear call to every pastor, doesn't it? Don't forsake it. Devote yourself to the public. This, reading, preaching, teaching of God's word. We saw this in Acts chapter 16 before the passage we read last week where we saw how the church at Philippi was started. If you back up and you see where Timothy joined up with Paul and Silas in the beginning of Acts chapter 16, and we see where when Timothy joined up and Paul and Silas were going out and preaching, it says this in the Word word of God. It says, the churches were strengthened in their faith and numbers were added to them daily. They were strengthened in their faith and numbers were added to them. Why? Because of the commitment to public teaching, preaching God's word. What what do you think of when you think of strength and increased numbers? Momentum. Anybody ever watched any sport? You watch the momentum shift in a team and how one team gets down on themselves and the other team gets a lift that they didn't have before? Can you hear God's word today? The church of Jesus Christ today in the year 2021 needs momentum. We need a lift. And it starts and comes through the preaching and teaching of God's word. It comes through us gathering through the Holy Spirit of God working in our hearts individually and collectively as a body as we work toward God's mission that God's called us to. So many times you hear the motto is, you don't go to church, you are the church. A lot of truth to that. But it could be dangerous because it puts being the church and going to church against each other. So yes, we are the church And if you are the church, then we need to come to church and be together and grow in what God's calling us to. God commands it. Being together brings power in this gathering. We've talked about the strength in numbers, this momentum that's sustained in this. And Jesus even said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, it says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So he is in the midst, guys, when we gather and there's strength in the presence of the Lord. And it provides growth. You see, there's this refining process, too, that takes place amongst each other. You think of Proverbs 27, verse 17, and everybody knows it so well. And it talks about how that as iron sharpens iron, right, so does one man sharpen another, okay? And I want us to see this, that God uses this in a special way. Because if we look at it and we, and we look at this aspect of this verse, it's talking about the very inward man. And it changes who we are because of the strength of being around another fellow believer. Because we know that the Bible also says that bad company will corrupt good character. So who you're around and who you're hanging with makes a big difference in the direction you're going always heard my mom and dad saying, you've probably heard it before too, you show me who your friends are, I'll show you what your future is. Who are you hanging out with, young people? What are you doing? Are you around people that will sharpen you the right way, or are you around people that are dull in your blade spiritually? Makes all the difference. So, let's get together. Let's get together collectively. Let's get together in life groups. It's so huge as, as I skip forward and move forward faster toward the end here because we're running out of time of Acts chapter 2 and how the church was started and people did life together and they met in their homes daily and they were of one accord, that there was unity there. That's the value of small groups. We call them life groups here. And that's why it's so important for you to get a part of, be a part of one. We've got the back signups in the back. Get with them after church and look at the life group that God would lead you to be a part of. Do life together. Get in those small groups and connected where you know people and they know you and you just do life together on a different level. It's so huge to what God's called you to. Our fourth and final point of how we find joy in the gathering is being a part of the gathering 
helps fulfill your purpose and your calling. Being a part of the gathering helps fulfill your purpose and your calling. You see in this end of this passage, after it talks about us growing in knowledge and all discernment, it says that, that, we, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled, here we go, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. God's ultimate goal to fulfill your purpose is to be filled with his righteousness, not yours. To be filled with the righteousness of Christ, to have the fruits of righteousness displayed to others to reach people. Hey, can we get this message? We're going to speak deeper on this in a few weeks as the passage comes up. But I want to tell you this right off the bat as we talk about this. God does not need your acts of righteousness. Did you know that? The Bible even says that our acts of righteousness are like filthy rags to him. God doesn't need your righteous acts, but your neighbor does. I'm going to say it again because not enough people said amen. God doesn't need your acts of righteousness. You're not justified by your acts. We're justified by faith. But your neighbor does need your righteous acts. They do need to see you living out the Bible in your life, to living out the word of God like it means something to you, that it changes the way you talk. It changes the way you, you walk. It changes how you speak to your wife. It changes how you raise your kids. It changes what you listen to, what you watch, that there's Christ in you. And that's all people see. God doesn't need that, but your neighbor does. Amen? Can we walk in that, and can we then hear Paul's calling in Ephesians, which he's going to mirror here in Philippians, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling? Man, that's why Ephesians is so hard, that second half of people, chapters 4 through 6, because there's very specific ways that we're to live our lives. And I, and I love the fact that you read through Ephesians and you see that the more you read that, the more you realize that if we claim to be followers of Christ, the less our life should look like the heathens. That we should be different. That we should be set apart. That we're called for something and fulfilling a purpose, which is the gospel, the great commission. And God will strengthen you and empower you to what he's called you to do. Paul even said it right there at the end. These acts of righteousness, which are by who? By yourself? No, which are by Jesus to the glory of God. It's by him and through his spirit that we even have the opportunity and possibility to live according to his word. Have you done that? Have you made that commitment? And then I love, speaking of fulfilling this purpose and his calling, in verse five, back when Paul said, that he who began this good work in you is gonna carry it until it's complete until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you understand and know that today? Do you know that what God's called you to, he's gonna see you through? No matter what the obstacles are, no matter what the circumstances are around you. But you have an enemy who doesn't want you to walk in those steps. Did you know that? He's gonna trip you up, make you fall for every lie, fall for every deception. He wants you to live in fear right now. He wants you to stay isolated so that he can eat you up and so that he can tear your family apart so that he can pull you away from your calling. Maybe you were listening to my sound of my voice and maybe you were once a part of the church before COVID and God was using you in a mighty way. You know God had called you to something and you were seeing God use you and you were seeing other people brought into church that were your friends that maybe hadn't been to church in a while and you saw God using you and you were part of the fellowship of a body of Christ and God was fulfilling his calling and then COVID-19 got in the way. And it pulled you out of what God was doing and set you on a different path. Is that you today? I can promise you one thing. God didn't use COVID-19 to pull you away from that. The enemy did. Did you know that to leave a church that you should not leave until you're freed by the Holy Spirit of God to do so? Because like we talked about, church is fellowship, it's family. If God had you a part of something, there are some reasons to leave. But then there's some reasons not to leave. Some of the reasons not to leave, move to the next best and greatest thing, the newest building, the biggest facility, the fanciest stuff. Another reason not to leave, my kids, friends go somewhere else, so that's where we're gonna go. That's dangerous. Because it puts your children in the spiritual leadership of your home. 
Guys, today I want to be very clear. Spiritual reasons to leave a church, falling of leadership, no accountability in leadership, false doctrine, fluff preaching. Yeah, you don't want to be a part of that. The Lord could easily remove you out of that to a fellowship that does something different. But he's never called you to leave just for superficial reasons. Just because your kids like it somewhere else or their friends go there. What's God calling you to do today? He longs to work in you. And in this opportunity, in this time, we have the greatest opportunity to be the church. As the culture continues to become more and more secular, we have an opportunity as a church to be different. We have an opportunity individually and collectively to ask ourselves, where are we not reflecting Christ and reflecting the kingdom of God in our lives and in our church? And how can we change that? Have you ever asked yourself that? Lord, what parts of me need to be changed that are of me or of this world and they're not of you and you need me to remove so that I can be formed more into the image of your son? You should ask yourself that daily. We have this opportunity then as we look that way to not be led inward where we become self-righteous and just trying to clean ourselves up ourselves, but we look to God to do it. We have an opportunity to not be led outward where we just try to conform to the world and fit into the culture. And so many people make that mistake that feel like you have to be like the world to reach the world. That's such a lie. You need to be different to reach the world, not like them. But obviously our focus should be upward and forward. Because here's the truth of the church. We must maintain, guys, our distinctiveness from the culture while at the same time being able to engage the culture. I'm going to say that again. We must maintain our distinctiveness from the culture while at the same time being able to engage the culture. Distinctiveness and engagement. That's the call of the church. That's the call to each and every one of us right now. So what's in you that Christ wants to carry out to completion today that the enemy doesn't want to come out? What is it? Is there a passion? Is there a desire? Is there a yearning deep down in your heart to make a difference for Christ? God wants to fulfill that through his spirit in your life. But an enemy wants to separate you out, get you away from the body of Christ where you were once flourishing in the spirit and God was doing his work. He wants to remove you from that so that God's work in your life can't be completed. Don't let him do that any longer. Make a resolve today to get back where God had placed you. Don't forget in the darkness what God showed you in the light. No matter how dark the circumstances get, God's truth will always be revealed if we persevere. It always seems like a great time to, to quit sometimes when it gets the toughest. But I can promise you there's never a good time to quit in Christ. Because when the night and the dawn is the darkest, the light's about to show up. And God wants to move you to something. And it's called persistence. Persistence that leads you to walk in joy even in prison like Paul. The darkest of circumstances where all despair, where everything seems lost. Persistence will carry you through, even through the challenges, trials, and persecution of this life. Persistence doesn't need human approval. It needs God's approval, and that's it. Persistence is fulfilling your calling when you say, Lord, I'm gonna trust you for what's ahead. It's fulfilling your calling by not compromising to a culture that's going the opposite direction. It's fulfilling your calling by saying, Lord, I'm gonna persevere and I'm gonna say when there's obstacles in my way, mountain be moved through faith, that you're gonna resolve in your heart and know that if God is with you, who can be against you? And to know that you are more than a conqueror and that the one inside you is greater than he that's in the world that's against you. Do you believe that? Will you walk in that perseverance, church, and know that we need a resolve in our heart to fight for the joy that God has set before us? And it has nothing to do with the circumstances we walk in. Nothing. Why? Because Jesus is our joy. Are your eyes focused on him? 
Can we take today's message today? Understand that there's joy in the fellowship. Through fellowship in the gospel, through family, through growth, in knowledge and discernment as the body of Christ, and through answering the calling that he has in our life to walk in the righteousness that he provides and trust and know that he's going to carry the work he started in you and to completion if you resolve in your heart to not give up, to not give in, and to make a stand for Jesus. Let's bow our head. Let's close our eyes. How today is, is the Lord speaking to your heart? What would he have you do right now to answer his call? To continue to walk in the ways he had set before you? Maybe COVID tripped it up. Maybe life tripped it up. And your heart has been deceived to go a different direction, to think it's okay to not be a part of church. Will you hear the message of the Word of God today that there's strength in the gathering and there's joy in the gathering that you won't get on your own. Maybe you're here today and you say, Brad, I want to be a part of that joy and fellowship that you talked about, about just having Christ in my life. And that's where it's going to start. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as Lord of your life, I want to offer you that opportunity today to pray a prayer from your heart to God's heart that I want to lead you through. But I want you to understand it's more than words. The prayer doesn't save you. It's the heart behind it that you're ready to bow your knee and surrender to a holy God who wants to fill you up. Are you there today? Will you do that today? Or maybe you're here and you say, Brad, I've, I committed my life earlier, walked in and out of church doors most of my life, and, but lately, recently, I've drifted away. I've been pulled away for various reasons, and I want to come back to him today. I want to come running back to the cross, and I want to, I want to fall down, and I want to re-surrender my life to him, rededicate my life to him, and get on fire for Jesus in a way that I haven't been recently. If that's you, I want you to pray the same prayer from your heart to God's heart, and let's get going, because God has the joy set before us to receive it for the first time or rededicate your life. Just pray this prayer. Say, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner, and I'm in need of a Savior today. Lord, I'm surrendering my heart to you. And I'm coming before you as a holy God on bended knee. And I'm going to confess you as Lord. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross that I could have forgiveness of my sin. That I could walk a life of redemption and freedom. And Lord, thank you for raising from the grave three days later that Lord, I can have that same victory, that same power that raised you from the grave. I can have that in my life because you proved you were God in that moment, that you were more than just a man. And Lord, I put my trust and my faith in you right now. And Lord, my commitment to you as I surrender all is to give my life to you. And I ask that you would use me, that you would use me and that you would start this good work in me and that you would complete this good work that you've started in me until you return or until I draw my last breath. Lord, my life is yours. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you meant business with God today. You received it for the first time or you rededicated your life. Would you boldly and unashamed right now raise your hand? Say, Brad, I prayed that prayer. I meant business with God. I want you to pray for me. Amen. Guys, we're going to close our service up like we do each week here at Impact. We're going to open this altar up. Whatever God has laid upon your heart, whatever God's moved in your life, I want to ask you to put action with your feet to whatever he's laid upon you. We can go ahead and stand to our feet. We're going to worship with all our heart, sing with all our voice, and praise to a holy God. But whatever the Lord's laid on your heart today, would you come up and do business with him? There's pastors up here. We can pray with you, talk with you if you like, or you can come right past us and just meet with Jesus today. Whatever it is, maybe he's calling you to join this church, to serve in a capacity, to pray for a loved one, to whatever it is, let's come as they play. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain 
Say. 
much. Great is his faithfulness. Can we give him a big round of applause today for what he continues to do in this church through this word? Guys, let's take this message this week to heart. Let's, let's find the fellowship in the gospel. Let's be a part of this family of believers. Hey, I want you to sign up, man. A lot of you have already vocalized you wanted to serve, looking for ways to, to get plugged in. Hey, if you've already told me or somebody else, we want you to sign up anyway. Go ahead and sign up. Let's get everything done. Hey, let's move forward what God's called us to do. And we'd love for you to be a part of what God's doing and get connected right there. Join life groups, whatever the Lord's leading you to do. Let's take this message and let's go this week and let's walk in the calling God set before us because he who started it is going to finish it. He's faithful. We'll see you next Sunday.